theoretically underpaid labor by people that were essentially forced by their economic conditions or by being taken into the country under false pretenses to participate in the construction of that embassy. And this is the subject of a major congressional investigation that I don't know is going to go anywhere now that uh, Obama is in the White House. Um, but on the issue of the contractors, I mean, what you what you asked Obama about a year ago is very, very important because Obama said in his answer to you that he didn't want to draw down contractors at a faster rate than he drew down U.S. troops. So even when Obama is talking about 50,000 troops remaining in the country, presumably that would mean 50,000 contractors to support them. So we're always talking about uh, deflated numbers when we hear them come out of the, uh, the mouths of administration officials. Um, on the issue of the mercenaries, though, the armed security contractors, uh, Blackwater, the company formerly known as Blackwater, now, you know, called Z, which is, you know, I mean, it's very, very interesting. Spelled this X -E. Um, you know, in the midst of a major rebranding campaign. What happened with Blackwater is that the Obama administration through the State Department informed Z, uh, Blackwater, that they were not going to renew their highly lucrative contract in Iraq. I think this was a result in large part of massive public pressure. I think that activists and concerned people and journalists who were exposing this really made it politically untenable for the Obama administration to at least publicly continue that kind of a relationship with this company, Blackwater. And I think that people who took this seriously should take heart in that. Um, Hillary Clinton, as, as Secretary of State, did make a pledge on the campaign trail that she was going to endorse legislation to ban uh, Blackwater's operations, and she took a lot of uh, heat for that. Uh, whether or not this was a decision that she influenced, I don't know. I mean, it, it seemed like it was sort of a cynical decision on the campaign trail aimed at outflanking Obama from the left. But the fact is that Blackwater's contract has not been renewed. Having said that, Blackwater is firmly entrenched in Afghanistan, continues with many lucrative U.S. government contracts, has now changed its name. Eric Prince, the owner of Blackwater um, and the CEO, this week announced that he was stepping down um, as the CEO, but will remain as the chairman. So, you know, I mean, uh, Eric Prince is not in control of Blackwater the same way that Vladimir Putin is not in control of Russia. He is in control of it. He just isn't officially. Well, wait, so ahead. let's explain all of this. Yeah. Um, let's really talk about Blackwater now. It, I think it astonished many when first they heard that Blackwater's new name would be Z, Z right. XE. It's a, it's a um, kind of gas. And then yeah. that Eric Prince was stepping down right. as CEO. But his position now? He's the chair. He remains the chairman of Blackwater. And he, he appointed a guy named Joe Yazario, uh, who was a former vice president at the international shipping company DHL, uh, to be the uh, president of Blackwater. And what's interesting about that is Eric Prince um, has consistently said that his vision for Blackwater is that it's going to be like the Federal Express of the national security apparatus. So he didn't hire a FedEx VP. He went with, with DHL, which has more of an international reputation. It's all very fascinating. Um, but, but Eric the, Prince is still so, there. So Eric Prince, right, he stepped down from the day-to-day -day running of, of the day-to-day -day operations at Blackwater, but he's still the owner and he's still the chairman of the company. He still has his private intelligence company that is marketing CIA-type services headed to by. Fortune 1000 corporations. Well, it's been headed by Kofor Black and Robert Richer, uh, both uh, CIA veterans, although um, in Prince's statement announcing his stepping down, he indicated that there have been sweeping either resignations or departures at the company. Gary Jackson, the president of Blackwater, is out. This was a guy who just a few months ago had said that uh, they would have to carry him out of Blackwater if he was ever going to leave there, essentially saying he was going to be at that company for life. He's gone. Other vice chairmen have left. Other people. There's clearly been a major shakeup there. And their symbol has changed. Right. Their symbol. Well, they, now they don't even call. It used to be the Blackwater was the was the name of all of the Prince's network of uh, of security companies and training companies. Now they've changed the name of their training facilities just to the U.S. Training Center. That's what's called. And instead of the, the sort of more sexy, uh, you know, red and black bear paw and the sniper scope logo, they now have this crude drawing that looks like it was like done by a high school art student of, a, of, a, of an American bald eagle with a yellow beak. I mean, it's really strange. I mean, maybe they maybe Prince stopped spending money on all of these PR firms or rebranding agencies or what have you. Um, but it, it all appears very crude. One thing that has been crude, though, is that Blackwater clearly has learned at least some semblance of a lesson about the power of activist campaigns and bringing out into the light their activities, because there's been a group operating under the uh, banner of Blackwater Watch for a couple of years now, and it, it's uh, it's from San Diego, where they have it, to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, all the way to North Carolina, Blackwater's home state, and they had blackwaterwatch.net. A year ago, Amy, last April, Blackwater registered the domain names for xewatch.org.com.net. Uh, as a, as a, this was a year before they basically 
basically even announced that the company was changing its name. Um, although Blackwater Watch now has rebranded itself and they call themselves Z Watch, uh, but they're still operating at blackwaterwatch.net. Um, so I, I think that, that Blackwater got what it needed from Iraq. It made a lot of money. It secured a reputation that in its world is actually a good reputation because they, they may have killed a lot of people, but they never lost a principle, as well, they I say. Well, I want to talk about killed a lot of people. Um, let's go back to Nisor Square. Right. I think people will be surprised to hear that Blackwater is not banned from Iraq by the Iraqi government. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the fact is, and, and, and Mr. Korb said this earlier when, when, when he was on, that the immunity has been taken away. I will believe that the immunity has been taken away from these killers when the first one of them appears in Iraqi court. The fact is, the U.S. government is not going to hand over uh, its citizens, especially former Navy SEALs working for these kinds of companies, to an Iraqi court. It's just, it's just not going to happen. So, you know, the Iraqi government can talk until it's blue in the face about not renewing licenses and, and, and all that. The U.S. has made it clear, Democrat and Republican, that it's going to do what it needs to do to protect its forces and personnel in Iraq. And if that meant keeping Blackwater there, the Obama administration would, would keep Blackwater there. Could you explain, though, if Barack Obama says he's keeping 50,000 troops, the, there's a lot of troops leaving then. Why doesn't he have enough troops to protect the embassy? Why do mercenaries, do private right. contractors have to protect the embassy? I mean, this is a debate now that, as a result of the radical privatization of the State Department's diplomatic security division, that's where these mercenary companies primarily work. They work for the State Department doing what's called diplomatic security. There has never been a mission of the size of this for diplomatic security. Um, this actually, this program started in the 90s when the U.S. restored Jean Bertrand Aristide to power in Haiti. They hired private companies through the State Department to serve as his protective force and to protect U.S. diplomats that were going in there with Aristide. Uh, that started this whole mercenary industry being a part of the U.S. State Department. So Bush turned it into a paramilitary force in Iraq. And what that meant was that the people that were sp uh, specifically trained to do this kind of executive protection were largely private contractors. And so the State Department does not currently have full-time employees that would be able to do that job. And the military has said it doesn't want to be bodyguarding U.S. diplomats. So the U.S. has painted itself into a corner. The Democrats have aggressively funded this program along with the Bush administration. And of course, it started and expanded under Clinton. And so it's, it's now a catch-22. The Obama administration says it wants to make them all full-time employees. It will take years to do that. Private contractors are going to be in Iraq for a very long time. And you mentioned uh, Afghanistan. But of course, not only private contractors, there is a surge going on now that uh, President Obama has announced, talking about escalating the war in Afghanistan. Just be, before we went on air, word of a car bomb exploding outside the main U.S. military base in Kabul, wounding three people on Wednesday. The Taliban have claimed responsibility. The blast outside the main base at Bagram wounded three civilian contractors working for a U.S. company. Wasn't clear what the nationalities of the three well, were. I mean, the last thing I'll say is this. We, we, you can look at, at, the, at the direction of U.S. policy like this. We have a president now who said he'll use preemptive military action inside of the borders of another country without informing the leadership of that country if he deems it's in the interest of the U.S., as in the case of Pakistan. Uh, a president who's just delivered what, for all practical purposes, uh, sounded like the victory speech of the previous president for his, uh, his war based on lies and illegal acts of aggression, and who is surging beyond the, the wildest hopes of the Republicans in Afghanistan, putting more troops than almost any other politician was calling for, um, and is, is going to get the U.S. further uh, uh, just sunk into the hole of, uh, of a very violent and bloody war of occupation in Afghanistan. Uh, this is once again an imperial presidency, and I think it's cause for great, great concern. Um, and unfortunately, the spines of many people that actually have the ear of Obama seem to have been surgically removed uh, now that he is president. And I think it's very disturbing that people don't speak truth to power. This is a very dangerous course this president is continuing. The alternative in Afghanistan? Well, I think that, uh, you know, Representative Marcy Kaptur, who you had on recently uh, discussing uh, the, uh, the fact that people should squat in their homes if, uh, if these banks are trying to take their homes away for them and say produce the note, um, I think put it best when she said that President Obama should call Russia and ask them what happened in Afghanistan. Uh, I think the, the United States has no respect for self-determination um, or independence of these countries. And I think that uh, there are international diplomats who have wide experience in both Iraq and Afghanistan who sh whose counsel should be sought out, uh, because the United States should be about the business of paying reparations. Uh, to these countries that it has participated in the destruction of, and looking for regional diplomatic solutions that inherently are non-military um, in their scope and are aimed at actual self-determination for the people of those countries. There's no internationalization of U.S. policy. There's no listening to indigenous voices. It's been military uh, solutions first.
Jeremy Scahill, I want to thank you for being with us. I think it's interesting, Jeremy, the book for which you won the George Polk Award, Black Order, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army, when it came out in paperback, it was going to be released on the day that Eric Prince's book, long delayed, was also going to be released, right. but they pulled it. Uh, yeah, I haven't. It was, there were a couple of times that, that Eric Prince's book was supposed to come out. Instead, the, this uh, executive producer at CNN, Suzanne Simmons, uh, who's been an apologist for the uh, mercenary industry, she seems to have written it for him. Her book, her book comes out in June. I think it's called Master of War. Jeremy, thanks for being with us. Jeremy Skill, award-winning investigative journalist, author of the New York Times bestseller, Blackwater, and Democracy Now! correspondent. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute.